Okay. I am going to stop sharing my screen here and we will get back into the um, Q&A session here. Thanks, Kate, for that inspiring presentation at the end there. That was great. I think I need to go get my grandson a Babies of Landsat uh, t-shirt or something because that looks really awesome. I'll hook you up, Brian. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. He's, he's one year old, so it's going to be a small one. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Um, what I'll do during this session is to monitor the chat area. So those of you, we have 57 participants out there. Some of these are panelists, but I'll ask the panelists uh, to take a look at the chat and we will go through some of these questions that come along. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. We will um, address those. And as for the panelists, feel free to jump in. And if you have any thoughts or would like to respond to any of these things, uh, please do so. Wow, we've got quite a bit going on here in the chat. So let's, uh, let's see if there's anything that jumps out here. Hang on one second. Um, I see, well, at the end there, Kate, I see that uh, you made the day of a few folks with your inspiring talk. And are there any other uh, questions out there in particular for the presenters or any topics that you would like us as panelists to expand on? Does anybody want to, to do that? There was a Q and A uh, question out there um, thanking us for the forum, but this person would like to know whether there could be any reliable ODC API reference other than existing notebooks in the official documentation. I'm not exactly sure what is meant by that question. Does anybody want to tackle that? The ODC API reference? All right, here's one for us then. Let's go to, will commercialization of open EO affect the open source distribution in any way? Alexander, Matthias? Yeah, sure, no. Uh, um, no, in, in no way this will affect the um, the open source of it. it, it even the development that we do in the commercial project is actually open source. So this means that still anyone can benefit from this. And uh, yeah, we put even new things out there new. So if any, then it only helps us to continue the development of OpenEO and have uh, continued funding for this activity, which is great. Uh, as I said, one of the key new things is really that we look into the federalization of uh, more different uh, cloud uh, infrastructures that have OpenEO running up there, which is really what is needed when we saw this in many of the presentations. We have all these large data sets which are distributed and we cannot really copy them around all the time as they become so large. So I guess um, um, right now I don't see any risk that the commercialization is an issue there. It's also not a general commercialization. It's just one entity, ESA basically, which has decided to offer a commercial service on, on using OpenEO. Anyone else can do this as well. Um, and uh, the heart of OpenEO is always open source and all of us are actually great open source enthusiasts. So I don't think that will be an issue when Matthias want to add something to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, OpenEO, the core is pretty much the API specification and the processes and those are open source and not connected to the commercial platform that we are building now as uh, well. So um, that, that core is always available uh, and can be built upon. And then of course there are the software components that are, but these are all also open source. I mean, there could be components that are developed closed source, but that will always happen with open standards, right? That's the same with, uh, OGC software and specifications. Thank you. Um, there's a comment uh, here about moving Open Data Cube towards Pangeo big data analytics. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I know, I know there's been some 
interactions between Open Data Cube and Pangeo. Uh, there are some similarities in how those two infrastructures uh, work with data and Pangeo works with really large data sets. Any thoughts out there? Has anybody had any experience with that on the panel? Maybe not. Um, I, I think if we asked sort of uh, this question to some of our developers, we might get a bit, uh, a bit here, a bit more. I'll take a stab at, there's a question here. Uh, Gustavo says, I'd like to hear more about the initiative of Open Data Cube in the United States and which data sets will be available. I get this question all the time. You know, why don't we have a uh, data cube for the US? Well, we don't because there's never been a real push or a single organization that wants to manage or maintain a data cube concept for the United States. What I have found in talking to, whether it be data organizations uh, like USGS and NOAA, NASA, or researchers, they tend to be fairly far advanced and they go out and they do things on their own and they get the data that they need. Um, where, where the niche I, I think falls is with younger researchers that are looking for new and innovative ways to interact with the satellite data. And that's where I think we can really inspire using Open Data Cube as a way in which they can use Python and they can use notebooks and they can interact with these data sets in various cloud environments. That's where I think uh, the, the niche could, could be, be best served. But in terms of a open data cube um, for the country, for United States as a country, I doubt we will see one like we're seeing it in other parts of the world. I think other parts of the world, because they're developing countries and they really don't have a managed infrastructure to share among the organizations there, that's where the benefit lies. So in places like we're seeing in Africa and Asia and South America, they have a need because uh, they have a broader set of stakeholders that have an interest in having an organized group surrounding uh, earth observations and sharing of, of information. Ryan. Yes, go ahead. Hey, Stephen. I, 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 yeah, so uh, Stephen Ramage here. Um, I, I think there's also something about your point about younger researchers because, and also to Kate's talk, that maybe the US is missing a trick because it's bringing together a community and it's people working together, helping each other. And maybe, maybe actually the US, US is falling behind because there's an assumption that because all the infrastructure and the money and everything is there, um, it would be nice to see some of these other places leapfrog the US in that way. And then for you to go back and say, hey, told you, you know, I think that's a consideration. I think the community part of it is a big part. And, and like, you know, Sisters of SAR and Ladies of Landsat and Women in Geospatial and uh, Copernicus Women and all of these different groups that are now coming out are sort of leading the charge in a way for some of this. So I, I think it's, it's worth taking a different perspective on you know, on that question. I, I, I agree with you. I think in the end, what, what will happen is other places will advance and then parts of the US or the US as a whole may look at that and say, well, we could also move along. I, I will give you an example of where I am seeing it in the US. There is a move for a data cube in the state of Virginia, and that is to support universities in the state of Virginia. There's one uh, data cube in California and then one of our workers lives in Seattle and he's working on a data queue for the state of Washington. So those are coming along, but the primary driver behind them is research within the educational communities, not as much with like government stakeholders, although some of the governments in California and Virginia are starting to gain some interest there. But ultimately where I see the open data cube has its largest impact is that sharing, sharing of between people and bringing uh, younger generations up to speed on how to use the satellite data. And so that movement, I think, is really taking off. And 
So maybe the rest of the world will be a model and we'll, we'll come along eventually. Um, looking at some of the other chats in here. Um, Stefano from Italy asks how you or somebody can help us in building federated digital hub powered by ODC in the Mediterranean countries. I have seen data cubes uh, pop up all over the world. You saw it in Stephen's presentation, that little map that shows there's data cube instances all over. Could it be done for the Mediterranean countries? Absolutely. Uh, what we've seen as the way it progresses and best moves ahead is that one or two stakeholder organizations, they decide to be the facilitator or the organizer for how it will come together because some group somewhere has to manage who are going to be the partners, how do we get the word out, how do we share among the countries. So if you're doing this for the Mediterranean countries, those countries might have to have some stakeholder involvement to decide how do we best manage this so that the, the countries within that area can share data, tools, and information. And that's how it, it uh, has come along. So uh, feel free to contact me offline or Stephen as well. We've been trying to facilitate some of these conversations. And, and frankly, that's how Digital Earth Africa came about. It started with some stakeholders at a very small scale in a few countries. Interest grew larger and larger and larger. And then some big stakeholders decided uh, to pull all this together. And, and now it's becoming a continental scale initiative with, with some really amazing impact. Anybody else maybe want to comment on that? Yeah, maybe in this direction, you can also contact us at Europe in this direction as we're also in Italy and for sure have quite some technical experience in the setup of these things. So be happy to talk about this and see what exactly you have in mind with this federated infrastructure and if it's only raster data or the vector data and other things that might get in there. There's a question from Marco uh, regarding Open Data Cube Initiative and the Open Earth Alliance that support the ODC. Any plans to create a more sustainable community hub, like a platform forum or whatever? Currently, the Slack channel is the main go-to point and definitely not a good solution. The short answer to that is we have it, and we've just recently released it. So I think the address now, as of just a few days ago, is forum. F O R U M forum dot open earth alliance dot org forum dot earth and open earth alliance dot org. And what we wanted to do was to create a user forum just for open data cube users around the world, various stakeholders. Now, this is a little broader than, for instance, um, Digital Earth Africa has their own community of users and their own. Uh, initiative that's well organized there. What we wanted was a forum that's a bit broader that could uh, inspire new organizations like the Mediterranean question to get more information on how they could use Open Data Cube and, and uh, satellite data. This is where we can entertain questions about this new uh, Google Colab environment that we have. And then maybe someday we have you know, other platforms. Anybody else want to uh, comment on that? Uh, I should go check out that forum if it's out there. Does anybody check that for me? Forum.OpenEarthAlliance.org. Is it there? Hopefully it's there. I believe it was supposed to be. It is. Ah, good. Someone put it in the chat there. Fantastic. Thank you. So that's our, that's our first stab at that. And so Open Earth Alliance was meant to take what the Open Data Cube technical community has done and try to use Open Earth Alliance as a geo community activity to expand the impact of Open Data Cube in, in many other ways. So, doing things like uh, this Google um, this Google platform that we have that enables people to dabble with the data in a free way, and a forum, a user forum, and also when it comes to things like implementing small instances of data cubes around the world and getting users to help each other. We're hoping that over time, that that's the way we can build a broad ODC community um, to, to discuss these things. 
Uh, question for you, Kate, do you see that one? Yeah, thank you, Gustavo. That's a that's a great question. Um, I, I mentioned this concept of asking who's in the room, but I think that that also applies to development of code and capacity building. Uh, so um, a lot of times the uh, applications, especially for Earth observations that are built, are not necessarily built with um, or are built in the absence of input from women and other underrepresented groups. And I think it's an interesting point that Stephen made earlier about the US. We often see um, an unintended consequence of maybe the US not having the right infrastructure for, um, for young and, and uh, up and coming groups to be able to apply this data to their needs maybe locally is parachute science. So um, doing conducting science uh, somewhere else often in developing countries kind of in the absence of those voices um, that really would be using that data. Um, so I think at a broad scale, making sure that you're, you're casting a wide net and asking who's gonna be using this data, uh, what capacity do they have to be able to um, apply and implement uh, this data is really important. And I think the second one, and I'm learning this through um, uh, all, live education through the open data cube sprint that's currently going on um, is there's a pretty big lack of um, education um, or availability of educational tools. Um, women, a lot of times, I, I don't like to generalize, but what we've heard from, um, from our user community and myself is that it can be really scary to ask questions on a large forum. Um, if your code is broken, um, if you're worried that you ha might have a dumb question, no dumb questions, I promise. Um, it, it can be scary. So making sure that there's a really, um, you know, a, a padded community where, um, where questions are welcome and responded to in a respectful, uh, a respectful manner, that goes a very long way. Um, and yeah, we, interruptions are common uh, when asking questions for women uh, so being able to, yeah, just being able to ask questions openly and have our problem solved um, by the community at large goes a long way. Thanks, Kate. Then, yeah, those are great points. And that's something that I hope uh, we as an Open Data Cube community strive to be more inclusive and to be open to the so-called, you know, dumb questions, because there are no dumb questions. And if people feel free and uh, are able to ask any question they want, we're going to bring so many more people along and it'll make the community uh, thrive in the long run. There was a question out there about uh, Digital Earth Africa. Uh, and Iswa or Steven, would you like to say a few words about that? My good friend and this one. Uh, it says concerning DE Africa, what are the plans in place to evolve research and academic institutions across the entire continent to benefit from the tons of geospatial resources available? So research and academic institutions, any thoughts? Yeah, so so one of the one of the mechanisms that Digital Earth Africa is being implemented is through what we call implementing partners, and uh, the regional institutions, um, including the research ones, are involved as implementing partners. And the idea is to is to broaden the uptake at the research uh, institutions, but also like if I take South Africa for example, we're partnering with our local universities uh, to get them either to use it during uh, teaching, but also to help develop the the curricula. So there's a there's a huge drive to get academia involved and to get uh, and to get the research community involved. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing actually, because the push is, at this, is, is, is so equal. We're pushing industry on one side, we're pushing government on the other side, uh, but there is the big drive now also uh, for, um, for the research communities to be involved. So in West Africa, for, for example, the, um, Oh, um, it's it, they, they change they change the name, so I've still got the old the old name uh, in my in my head, and I don't want to use the old name. Uh, <laughs> they they involved and in, and in Axti as these um, uh, regionally set. You find you find them in North in North Africa, uh, West Africa. Um, they 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 in. So some of the local uh, universities like Madagascar, the University of Antananarivo is involved, um, and and they vary. 
the level of involvement. Uh, others are in for validation and verification. They participate in that. Others are in are looking at using it as part of the teaching and research uh, curriculum. You mean averages? Averages, yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> averages, yes. Also, the universities are also involved in the capacity development and the rollout of the capacity development plan for uh, for Digital Earth Africa. I see in the Q and A there is an interesting question about: Is there any list of currently available data cubes? and any way to interrogate that list before thinking about ingesting it as someone else's hosting cube. And I guess my short answer is no, there really isn't a list. I, I do have a little spreadsheet of all of the countries that have um, interacted with us as an ODC community and have inquired about the open data cube. And I know there's some of that going on, but what I probably don't know are the real data cubes that exist out there. Like we know the Swiss data cube is out there. Could someone in Switzerland or in that region somehow get involved with a Swiss data cube or have access to some of those tools or data or services? And that's a really great point because if, if we were able to make that list, uh, then maybe that would help move some of these regional initiatives a little further down. Like another example is Mexico. Mexico has their own data cube activity. It's really run by their government specific to Mexico, but they're also interested in growing the data cube, open data cube initiative to the entire region so that they can share with other countries because they want to bring other countries along within their region. So that's a really good idea. Uh, maybe, you know, Stephen, you and I should probably think about that a bit and how we might compile such a list because it's yeah. that's a really good question. I was actually wondering regarding this question and maybe also a question to Stephen, if, if in the next GEOS or GEOS uh, general activities, I mean, that's a catalog service, right? So that would be a place where you could start this list and make sure that the metadata is standardized in a way that they're all findable. There. So have you thought in this direction already, Gio? I have literally three hours ago sent an email to someone asking about what would we do with Geos and the open data cube and how do we how do we sort of connect and link all this stuff together. So uh, I haven't had an answer, so I don't know what to say, but yeah, it, it, it's I think my, my last slide on the Open Earth Alliance was I, for me, I see that as one of the ways of connecting a lot of these disparate activities and doing it. Um, I, you know, this, this session is about sort of advances in what's happening. And one of the big advances for me is actually around funding and policy. And so if there's a way to drive more funding and, and policy development, then we can raise more money to help do more of these things. So. You know, I, I think if we're just doing it for the sake of doing it, it's quite hard and you've got to get volunteers. But if we can put it under the banner of something, then it's a lot, it's a lot easier to do. So, yes, it's, it's definitely some for consideration. And now that Brian has, has mentally said it, we'll probably talk about it afterwards too. I wrote it down. I'll, uh, we'll follow up on that, think about that, definitely. There's a question, uh, Kate, for you about what are some wins in the diversity inclusion space that you're proud of? I know you had some of those in your presentation, but maybe there's a few others that come to mind. Any thoughts you wanna share there? Yeah, and I'll pass it on to Andiswa after. Um, I think that broadly we're in kind of an exciting time, uh, still a frustrating time for uh, diversity inclusion. We went through really in the past five years or so, um, filtering out a lot of really negative characters and narratives that occur in STEM in general, Earth observation, uh, they weren't really paid attention to. So I'm talking big things like sexual harassment, abuse, and bullying. And we've shifted into, uh, because of that movement, we've shifted into a space where now we can talk about some of the more nuanced uh, issues that still face us with um, representation and inclusion. Uh, so again, that's that can be much harder to parse out. But the really cool thing now is that 
we're being listened to. Uh, so there's an active place for us to share our thoughts, concerns. Um, there's something called man all watch where we're, we're kindly pointing out when uh, it's all men on a, on a panel, even though there is a large uh, pool of women and experts and leaders to choose from. Um, that, that, that's the same for earth observation and STEM in general. So I think we're in a, what the win here is that we're in a time where we're actually able to make some change. Uh, we have groups like Stephen um, and others who are really interested in making sure that that parachute science isn't occurring, uh, that those in developing countries, indigenous folks are able to really participate in a way that they were before. And that's, that's a holistic ecosystem occurring globally within this space. So it wouldn't be possible without all of these open data cubes and this uh, cyber, this democratization of cyber infrastructure in which that totally removes the barrier to entry for a lot of folks. Um, and that, that means that we get this wider pool of people that we get to, we get to see uh, and hear from. Um, and that representation is so important. So I think um, yeah, to summarize, we're in a really exciting time in the movement where we're able to share our concerns and they're actually listened to. Uh, and that, for me, that's a big win and I'm excited to be a part of that. And Diswa, would you, you wanted to add a bit to that? And there's also another chat question for yeah. you. So take it away. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm going to try not to multitask and read that question <laughs> once, I, once I answer this one. Um, so, so, so I think, I think actually Stephen has stolen my thunder because I was going to say, for me, one of the biggest wins uh, 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 and the highlight for me for this year uh, on EDI is that we have men involved. Um, and 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 to 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 have men involved, and also we have institutional support. So Geo recently, uh, the executive committee uh, endorsed the Geo uh, Equality, Diversity, and Inclusion statement. I've been in Geo since uh, 2003 when it was still the ad hoc group, and every time we tried to talk about uh, equality and diversity, gender. Um, it's, you know, you see, you see Brian Kellogg's and uh, it's like goes over the heads, you know. <laughs> um, but, but now we're in, a, we're, in a, we're, in a, we're in a place where it's so welcomed and, uh, and people are wanting to engage, uh, engage with it. So it's quite, it's, it is an exciting time. Digital Earth Africa um, uh, has a strategy on, 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 on EDI. To, to build a platform and say, well, we'll communicate about this platform and we'll build the products. But wait a minute, we will make sure that these products re ad address equality and they built to, to make sure that diversity and inclusion is included. Th these are game, are game changers, I think, especially in the earth observation space, yeah. Thank you. So I'm gonna to try to read the question and then I'm gonna come back to you because I do not multitask regardless of what people say about women. <laughs> Um, while you're while you're digesting that question, I'll, I'll I'll make a comment just to follow up on what Kate said. So, Kate, I was I was in a CIOS meeting about a month ago, and it was a capacity building meeting. And I happened to notice it was a, there was eight of us in the meeting, and it was seven women and myself. And I I just thought it was so refreshing and interesting to see. And it, it was funny that sometimes, and I'm sure you as a woman get in these meetings and you and you look around and say, Oh wait a minute, there's eight men in me. And yet I got in that meeting and said, wait a minute, there's seven women and myself. And it was the first time I ever really noticed that, but I just thought this is really awesome. You know, it's, it just kind of came to be as we are getting better at all of this stuff and more inclusive. And yes, it's good to notice it once in a while, but sometimes it'd just be good and not even to notice. And we all just kind of blend and we really work together. It, it's really great. But anyhow, that was my recent experience. That was really cool. And, and we appreciate that. We appreciate that change. Uh, I think the uh, Stephen here and the few gentlemen who are part of the equality and diversity and inclusion subgroup of GEO feel exactly like that. They walk in and it's just full of women. Uh, uh, but the, the question on the chat uh, on, on, on how, this is, how this is looking in, 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 in Africa, it's, it's still sadly a male dominated um, uh, a field, but it's, it's like some of the things Kate said, that it's when you get to the front, so if you look at leadership positions like the one that I'm in, you do not see the women. 
uh, when you go to the background, the practitioners, the researchers, uh, and the technicians, there's a lot and lot of women. So when we look even at conference uh, presentations uh, and the presenters, you find, but why is he presenting? So and so is the one who she's the one who's doing the work. Why is he presenting? So 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 we definitely definitely the the field has not has not leveled has not leveled out yet and the some of the dominant cultural um backgrounds it within the continent still hold us back I, i've been to regions in the continent and i i am a very empowered woman uh and 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 but there are regions in this continent where i could feel this small if it was not because I refuse to be made to feel small, but it takes everything you got uh, to actually occupy a seat in the in, in, in a meeting room and feel that you you here. So we still have a lot we still have a lot to do in this in this regard, which is why we welcome initiatives like what um, uh, um, Digital Earth Africa is doing, the Women in GIS in Africa. All of these initiatives are trying to build this up. The African Leadership Conference. We're trying to build this from the youth up uh, that we, we need to clear the field. So we're not, we're not yet in the leveled field, unfortunately. What we need is more Kates and Diswas and Sarahs out there because your strong voices are awesome. Making a well, difference. I'll add one more thing. And it's exactly what Andis was kind of pointing to, but this larger concept that we've come a long ways really in the past decade towards getting women into STEM, but then now we are in this crisis of keeping women in STEM. And one bad interaction like Andisa was talking about where you don't have a community to back you up, I will truly get on our Ladies of Landsat Slack channel and say, I've had a terrible day. This is what happened to me. And the group will say, you rock, you know, don't worry about it. This is not about you. If you don't have that, that one scary or disheartening experience could allow you to just quit earth observation or science in general. And that's where we're we're at right now. So that's why having a community behind you is so important because we're all wired for connection and having that connection can be the, the choice between staying or leaving this field. So um, let me throw out a, a broader question. And that is, if anybody wants to comment, where do you see EO in the next 10 years? How do you see this environment we're working in open data cube, how we interact with satellite data. Do any of you have any visions for what, what is this going to look like in 10 years from now? I think maybe as a first take on this, I really hope that nobody has to think about files anymore. I think we, with all these new technologies, we really get away from this packaging things to small things that are digestible and just really get access to the information. That's, I mean, really the key thing here. And I really hope that all this new technology that we are developing now brings us into this direction so that we really get away from thinking about the structure of the data, how it's sensed and so on, and really can more work just with the data. And I also hope that this will be uh, more integrated and, and, and federated so that a lot of different parties can work together in a, in a big network to this in, instead of having all these separate entities. Maybe what you, the question before about the national uh, data cubes was something which I thought, I, I wondered how useful it actually is to have all these individual national data cubes when you already have so many global data cubes available. And probably it's more about how to connect the global ones and represent and make them viewable as national ones without actually needing to duplicate the data for this, for example. That's, that is what, that's, uh, I share that vision for this idea of national versus global data cubes, because you know, we're, we're seeing this in, in Africa too. Even though we have this continental scale data cube, right behind that is really a global set of data. And then you've got a continental set of data, and yet there's countries still saying, well, I want my little data cube, right? I want my piece of that. And it's hard to explain to them that you can do anything you want with your little piece of that larger data. And you can call it your own country data cube if you'd like, and there's things that you can add to it. But so I think there's a little paradigm shift that's got to happen with all of this. In the end, I think 10 years from now, we're just gonna have global scale data everywhere 
and it's just going to be there and it's going to be pre-processed and just ready to use instantaneously and it's going to be lightning fast and then you can do an analysis over your house and over your region and over your area and no one will know it'll just be and it might be you know mixed and stored all over the world but that's kind of where I see it going. It's just everything's going to be super fast and it's it's all just going to be there for you. I love ahead, also. Andy. Is that Andes for raising your hand? Did you want to say? Sorry. You go. Uh, okay. Sarah. You, Sarah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. I just, I love what uh, you said about uh, not worrying about files anymore, Alexander. That was great. Um, as the, as the cloud native geo advocate of the morning um, or evening, wherever you are. Uh, I love the idea of just not thinking about files, just accessing the data. Um, and I mentioned in my talk about how, you know, back in the day we would order disks of data. That was like a thing. I'm sure a lot of you have done that. Um, and thinking about paradigm shifts, like Brian said, just the paradigm shift from accessibility of data over the last 10 years, like seeing how that has changed the EO industry and the type of work you can do. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it becoming even more of a immediately accessible data type um, to where it's not uh, it's not something that you mail order, you know, you order a CD in the mail and you wait a couple of days and then you get your tiny uh, piece of raster data that you can do analysis on, but it's just integrated into daily workflows across the board, not only for GIS analysts. Um, I, I say this too much, but making spatial not so special anymore, just so it's integrated into data science across the board is really the goal, uh, de-siloing the access to the data. Um, and then, and this way you had, you had your hand, I guess. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Sir. On, 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 one, on one part, I, I fully agree that we, we most probably in 10 years time, we would be in a space where we're talking about the global data cubes and we're not worrying about the national data cubes but until such a time that all the resolutions that are required for making local decisions are put into the data cubes we we force so this is why south africa is doing the the digital ad south africa is because it's high resolution but the intention is definitely not to do landsat and sentinel because that we pull from uh, from Digital Earth Africa. Um, but for me in 10 years, I, I will not be promoting Earth observations. I will not be going around and telling people what the power of this technology is. Uh, people will know. It will be like weather. Now you just look at your phone and you're not thinking about the weather stations or the satellites that have launched. All you know is that you can get your information on the weather and uh, that's what I'm looking for. for for in 10 years time. People just find the information and we don't have to be selling this technology and convincing people about the power of the technology. I love it, that's good. I also, I love Sarah, your comment, uh, spatial is not, or yeah, spatial is not so special anymore. That's, that's good. That should be your tagline on your emails. I like that. <laughs> I, I use that too much. So there's probably people tired of hearing me say it. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I see something there, like Stephen Bryan attempt this question. Uh-oh, sharing your wealth of experience within GEOS. What do you think research-reliant countries of Africa need to do to scale up their involvement in geospatial technology? Ah, Stephen and Deswa, you can help out. It said Stephen and Brian. <laughs> <laughs> it's equality, yeah. So what resource yeah, re so what, what do you think about resource reliant countries of Africa need to do to scale up their involvement? So I, I guess what you're suggesting is the countries in Africa without the large resources, how do they get more involved in using these technologies is I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that may be what the question is. That's where I think a, an initiative like Digital Earth Africa is so valuable. It, it's a it's a broader initiative that brings the data, brings resources and brings capacity building to the region. Whereas some of the more advanced countries in that region may not need it as much, but the, the less advanced countries, the ones that are resource deprived uh, can really take advantage of this and they can bring themselves into the fold a little bit better. They can communicate and now 
share things with other countries in that region, I think it'll make the whole region much stronger. I, I think there's also, um, so, so geo has regional geos and in Africa we have AfriGeo. So Digital Earth Africa is still pretty new. And AfriGeo has been looking at land degradation, at water resources management. I mean, and this one was as much better than me, but it's been doing all that stuff for many, many years. And so AfriGeo is a good entry point as well because you have a community that supports Digital Earth Africa, but that has gone through all of these challenges of finding resources, finding budget, finding skills, finding expertise, finding the correct people. So I, I would say look at, you know, wherever you are in the world, look at the different regional geo networks, you know, whether it's AOGO for Asia Oceania, AfriGeo for Africa, um, AmeriGeo for the Americas, EuroGeo. I think, you know, they all exist and they're there to sort of serve that purpose to help leverage and, and bring people in. And this one, you're nodding. Anything I missed? All good, all good. Okay, any other uh, comments out there? I see uh, Roshni put something down there about our new word for 2021 is ubiquitous. <laughs> That's you good. Know, I, I can't say that word. No? <laughs> Yeah, see, she's muted. She's trying to say that word, but she's muted. Did you want to say something, Stephen? No, well, I was just, I was just going to laugh at you know the, these ten-year cycles of spatial is special and ubiquitous, and as all these people come in and people start to, you know, these these things rise, and then you spend another ten years and they kind of fall, and then something else comes through. It's, I, I, what I see a lot of just now is everyone trying to explain sort of geospatial in, in layperson terms. And that, I think that's really great. Um, and, and I think I was going to say something about mobile phones in 10 years. That's where I was like, maybe, maybe not the weather analogy, but I, I, get, I get asked a lot about um, how do we just show something on a mobile phone to a lay person, like my, my, my mother. And, and I don't know if I want to show Earth observations to my mother. I don't know if I want to go to that level. I mean, this is an entire other conference on this. Um, but the, maybe, maybe I'll leave it at the weather. Maybe the weather's good enough. We, we have a few people in CIOS, uh, Yvonne Pettitville, that many of you know, and he often gives a presentation at CIOS and he says, I, I, I believe my mother could understand this. So if, if he can, you know, bring it to a level, he says, if my mother can understand this, then we're going to be, we're going to be successful in telling our story. Can, can I just say, my mother sent a box of full of chocolate from Scotland to Switzerland yesterday. It was 23 kilos of chocolate. <laughs> I just thought I'd add that in. It's so random. Uh, 23 kilos. Tell her that the, uh, yeah, there was a lot of carbon lost in that transport. Yeah, I, I, I'll go back to what Brian says. All righty. Well, we're, we're coming near the end here. So we're, we're nearing the top of the hour. And uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap this up at this point. But I wanted to thank all of the panelists. Thank you very much for your presentations and for the discussions here this afternoon. I think these were great. All of this uh, will be recorded. And if you want to watch yourself at a later date, or there's others that might be watching us, Hopefully they'll uh, enjoy the conversation. So uh, with that, we'll we'll end this session. Don't forget, there's still an open data cube conference going uh, on a bit longer, and I hope that uh, you all can get involved in this and continue this charge into the future of using open data cube as a little bit of the glue that helps us progress everything around geospatial data everything around equality and equity and the things we can do for the future. And maybe Open Data Cube will just have a little bit to do with all of that and some of these uh, long-term goals that we think uh, are important. So thanks again. I uh, appreciate everybody attending and have yourself a great day or a great evening. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Roshni. Bye.